It's good to be here as we come together for our lesson of the hour today. And I hope that we'll be edified by what the Word of God teaches us today. We'll talk about a lesson about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who have obeyed the gospel, those understand that we have to have faith in order to please God. And the conviction about what we believe needs to be fully in our lives and lived out each and every day that we live. The title of our lesson today is Serving God with Conviction or Convenience. And we see that in the life of Jesus as he would tell people who would follow him how they would have to follow him. It would not be a matter of simply convenience to follow Jesus, but it would be of conviction that would lead them to what he would have them to be as followers of him. In Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 21, here the Bible speaks about the rich young rulers, we call him. And the Bible begins with verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him. He asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That's a very familiar story to us. We've used it in lessons in the past. We've talked about the rich young ruler from time to time as a man who wanted to have eternal life, and yet he was unwilling to do what Jesus told him to do. In some ways, I look at the story and I want to kind of look at it from this perspective. He wanted to follow God, but also have the convenience of his life as it was. No changes really when it comes to all the things that he had in his life. But Jesus turned all that upside down when asked him to sell all he had and give to the poor. And then come and take up his cross and follow him. And so there's more than just having God in our lives and everything else. And I, again, that's not the problem. I believe his problem was that of idolatry in the sense of riches being his idol. And he wanted Jesus, but he wanted his idol as well when it comes to that. And so Jesus realized there's people that have to be divorced from whatever, keeping them from full service. It may be inconvenient to have God and 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 Jesus and, and all these riches and all his life the way he wanted it. But yet it's not pleasing when we have those things that distract us in our lives. That's really what the lesson's about today, about getting rid of things that might uh, be one things in our lives that need not be there in some ways. Well, ask the question though this morning. What is conviction? What is convenience? And this again, this is setting up the lesson, if you will. Conviction, as the dictionary tells us, is the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what he believes or says. And I think that's a good definition because when we have convictions about what is right, what is wrong, it's what we firmly believe, that we believe that stealing is wrong, that lying is wrong, and that all the Bible teaches us is true concerning the Word of God, concerning moral questions and doing what's right. And the convictions even about who Jesus is. And we've talked about a lesson not too long ago about <coughs> recognizing Jesus. And because of that, our convictions, convictions lead us to follow him. And what is this idea of convictions? Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we see a picture of this. In the New American Standard Bible, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If you ever had something that you knew, you know you could not prove it by eyesight and things like that. Like, take for instance, how many of us know that there's places in other countries that what we see sometimes on the news is real because, you might say because people have been there, but we've never been there. We are convicted because of different reasons when it comes to that. And there's evidences besides having to see something for ourselves. And I think that's what the Bible recommends, that we don't have to see 
what happened in Genesis with all the world made and all the substance uh, we find around us, things are designed for us. But we are convicted. We understand that's who we are as Christians. We, we, we walk by faith and not by sight, as Hebrews tells us as well. In Romans chapter 14, verse 5, here's another passage that uses a different Greek word, but it talks about the same idea, about being fully convinced. That's really what having a conviction is, is being fully convinced of a truth of God's word. And I think that's what Paul is driving at Romans 14, about one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And so that tells us somewhat about having convictions. And I think those were individual convictions, whether one does things in some ways that are not sinful of themselves, and that someone does other things, like eating of meats, and really that's what Romans 14 is talking about, eating of meats or herbs, and being a vegetarian versus a person who loves steak. And so, again, that shows us how we need to all have this in our minds, who we are. And he says even in that passage, Romans 14, about whatever is not of faith is sin. So we have to have that, these convictions developed. What about convenience, though? If you look at the dictionary, you find what the definition of convenience is. It's a thing that contributes to an easy and effortless way of life. And I'm really speaking to the idea that some people have the notion that the Christian life should not have any kind of problems, should not have any kind of, of pressure against it, or it, it's just the easiest life that you can live. Now, I want to do suggest this, that the Christian life is made difficult by different things. <clears throat> the pressure of the world, the pressure the devil puts on us with temptations. And the idea of convenience here is giving in to this idea that once you become a child of God, the devil simply leaves you alone. And that you have no problems. But that cannot be farther from the truth. We realize the idea of convenience. Just being one who's, who's not really there when it comes to service. You know, the idea of you know, coming to service is a convenient time maybe to, to take a nap and such. Now there was times when I put the little children to sleep with my lessons and things. But that's not what we're talking about. The idea of convenience is something that we realize we're living the Christian life. It's going to be difficult times in our lives. It's not always a bed of roses. Not always a time that everything's going to go right like these televangelists tell us. You know, these so-called people who always this positive mental type of attitude that if you become a child of God, you become healthy, wealthy, wise, and there'll be no difficulties. God will take away all your difficulties. That's not real, is it? That's not the real Christian life. There are times when there's inconveniences that happen in our lives. And that what, if we think that it's going to be that way, we're setting ourselves up. And we'll talk about the moment. There's, there's a passage I want to key in on about that, that Jesus talks about in the parable of the sower, about that. But again, we come to this idea, what is conviction, what is convenience? When it comes to service to God, what does it mean? First of all, it means believing and doing what God says even when it's not easy to do. And I, I think that's probably one of the hardest things for us to understand is that sometimes what God asks of us, we have to muster up all that we can in order to do some of it. Now, there's some things God says that are easy to do. You know, like the idea of going out and robbing a bank. I don't think any of us here are, are really have that problem with that. Maybe that's something we don't have to worry about. But there's other temptations the devil will use against us that will maybe be more difficult. Or the things that we'd like to do but we can't do because we really understand it's not what God wants for our lives. And so that's really the idea of, of conviction over convenience in our lives today. And it means acting out of conviction, faith. And I believe that goes back to our foundation of everything who we are is that we are people of faith who have chosen to serve Jesus as our, our master and our Lord today. And when he tells us to do something, when he tells us or not to do something, 
Yeah, we have to look at that in that way. There's times when people came to Jesus and he said, well, you know, you have to deny yourself and take up the cross and follow him. And that's really, the idea is, it's not a life of convenience. Denying self, taking up that cross is still something that's difficult even today to do. But Hebrews 11, verse 6, that passage that says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's one of the first Bible passages that I memorized as a young child. And I was, uh, I think John 3, 16 is probably one of the first ones I memorized as a young, young man when I first obeyed the gospel. But Hebrews eleven six is one of those passages that defines the kind of faith we have to have and where faith leads us. It leads us to seek after God and to do that in a diligent manner. And that we must believe who he is, first of all, and that the reward is a real reward that God gives to us. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, which I will put on the chart here, it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And that reminds us, there were people back then who saw what God asked of them. And it was difficult. Imagine if you had to, to save your family, have to build an ark like Noah did. And it was a major undertaking. It's not something, well, it's easy. It was extremely inconvenient to have to go and get the gopher wood, bring it to where the building site, where they built the ark at. And it took years to build that with his sons and, and all, that, all that time spent laboring. Think about it. They're, they're saying, well, God tells us it's going to rain. It's going to have a flood here on the earth. And they're preparing that ark with all that in mind. And it really makes what you and I do today look easy, doesn't it? To have to go build an ark. You know, we're not under the patriarchal age. We're not under the mosaic age. But we are in the Christian age when we have to do things that are testing of our faith today. We are moved, divinely warned of things not seen like Noah. And I think that's the application for us, that the example of Noah to spur us on because we know this world's going to end one day. And I think that's, it's not going to be ending with water, it's going to be ending with fire. And that reminds us so much of why we're doing what we're doing. What we're doing right now is preparing ourselves for eternity. And so people of faith will do that. Convictions lead us in that direction, don't they? You know, our convictions are either going somewhere or they're going nowhere. You ever thought about that? Your convictions, what you believe, is either going to take you somewhere or nowhere in your Christian life. And so we have to be faithful to what God says. And acting out of love for God. John 14, 50, that simple passage. If you love me, keep my commandments. And that reminds us so much of why we do that. The motivation is love for God, love for Jesus, and doing what he says because we love the Lord. That's first and foremost, isn't it? The convenience makes our service to God less than the best. Have you ever thought about, well, it's too hard to go out to service every first day of the week? There's people who actually maybe think like that. And I hope that none of us have that attitude because I believe we stress the idea of coming to services. That you need to be here. Part of it is because this is God's plan for our lives. And we give this, we devote this time every Sunday. Have you ever thought about that if you didn't, if you just stayed home every Sunday? That would be the convenient thing to do. It would be the wrong thing. It would be less than what we, if we just went once a year to services, there would be something extremely lacking in our lives, our spiritual life. It would be less than what God wants it to be. In John chapter 10, verses 11 to 13, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now we see the best is what Jesus is talking about here. He, he gives everything for the sheep. He gives his life. And you really can't give any more than that, can you? To sacrifice your own life is the most that you can do. Notice what it says here. But a hireling, it, he, is, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, 
sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's not a hire because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Now you see the difference in the attitudes. I believe one, you might say, is one of conviction. Jesus was the ultimate in conviction. He believed God, his Father, so much and was committed to the plan of saving you and I so much that he went to the cross and died. That's the level of his conviction. Now, the hiring thing he's talking about here is someone who's hired for the job and they're really not invested like the sheep. <coughs> Can you, we make an application, if you will, to children of God today with that? There are people who maybe are not invested like they should. And when difficulties come, when the wolf comes, that's when the hireling leaves because he's, I'm out of this. You know, you might say, well, here comes a wolf. I'm, they up and run and they're out of here because they don't want to face dangers. You know, if somebody who really loves the sheep is invested in the sheep like Jesus was, they would, would stop that, wouldn't they? They would stay right there and defend the sheep. But, you know, that's not the case. Jesus realized that hireling is only there because he's been paid to do so. And, and he's really not invested like he should. And that could actually be applied to some preachers in some ways. who Preachers who really don't love the flock and they're doing this because of a paycheck. That's really the problem, isn't it? I've heard people talk about this hireling system and things like that. And talk about that. I think Jesus is talking about people who, who really don't care about doing the Lord's work as they should. And so Jesus does that. That's the difference between the good shepherd and a hireling in that way. Now I want to talk about people of conviction, if you will. That's really what this lesson is about. And we're talking about people of convenience. Those who serve God out of conviction. I believe Job was like that. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Take your Bible and turn over there. In Job chapter 1. We don't talk about Job too much. We had a, a Bible study about him. But one of the things about Job is that he was a man of conviction. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, and fearing God and turning away from evil. Now he talks about all the stuff that he had, all the 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. He was wealthy. And we drop down to chapter, chapter 1, verse 6. Now it was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves with the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, where do you come? Then Satan answered and said, Lord, said, answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth, walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth. A blameless man, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? I'm going to stop there. What's Satan accusing Job of? Well, you've given him all these benefits. You've blessed him so much. You know, he's serving out of convenience rather than real conviction. That's really what Satan was trying to get, was trying to, to tear down Job and to get him to not believe in God. But did it work? And the Bible tells us that here, the Bible tells us in verse 10, Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But you put forth your, your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. We see how that all played out. Satan destroyed everything he had in a moment of time. It was like one servant comes, another servant comes. You, all these things ha happened to you and taken away all. Even his sons and daughters were all killed in this, you might say. Job chapter 2, verse 3. All that, you, if you consider Job, I didn't know that was on there, but one of the things I think about this is that in through everything, Job did not lose his integrity. Job 19, verse 25. You know, even in his darkest hour, when we studied this back in Coleman, 
I was given chapters 15, I think it's chapter 21, to talk about Job and all the things that happened to Job. Chapter 19 was probably my favorite because it really shows us the level of conviction of Job. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And he goes on to talk about that. And so even though all these things, bad things happen, your friends have accused you, Job, over and over and time after time, Job still stayed on, stayed the course, persevered. That's why he is called an example of patience, of perseverance. In the book of James, we're told to emulate Job in our lives today. Moses, in Hebrews chapter 11, 24 to 26, says, By faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the approaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. Now again, this is talking about a man of faith. As he's, both of these... Uh, you might say, are part of what we call great examples. In Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith, he's talking about what Moses did because of his faith. By faith, Moses. And that really qualifies each one of these people, like Abraham, Moses, Noah. By faith, they did these things. And what did Moses do? He chose, he made a choice, a deliberate choice, not to stay in Pharaoh's house where it was convenient, where it was easy. You know, he could have stayed there, but he chose not to. He chose to leave all that behind, refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's a 180-degree change, if you will, from going easy to the hard life with the, with the Israelites. Now, why did he do that? Because he saw the reward. Just like we see the reward. We say, even though we have to suffer sometimes in our lives as a Christian, we know it's worth it because God offers us the reward. We look to that recompense, don't we? Paul also was a man of conviction. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul suffered many things for the Lord. And that's really what, when he called him, he said, I want to show him how many great things he must suffer for my name. That's when Jesus on the road to Damascus when he said that. But here's Paul's own words. He says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That's conviction. Under fire, if you will. Someone who's suffering. You know, I, I thought about putting the lesson that, and I actually wanted to put this verse in, where Paul says, If I had ceased from preaching what I'm preaching. You know, the, the suffering would cease, but I would not be faithful to God in some ways. You know, Paul is actually talking about in the book of Galatians about the fact that he's still preaching Christ and reproach for it. You know, if he was stopped and was compromised, compromise would be an easy thing. It would be convenient to preach it flat, preach it round, and just simply preach what people want to hear like so many cotton candy preachers do today. Paul was not like that kind of person. He was not a feel-good type of preacher. He was somebody who preached the gospel without apology, with love and boldness, just like we all need to as preachers. Preach the word of God in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, like he told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. But there's those who serve God out of convenience, like Jeroboam. And I think he is probably the pinnacle of this. The man who compromised the worship of God just to make it convenient for others. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. You know, we all know the motivation for this. Because the kingdom was divided between him and Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, that he did not want the people to go back to where Rehoboam was there in Jerusalem in the south. So what he did was he made two, the two golden calves, and Dan and Bethel. He said, these are your gods. He's making it convenient. The problem is he changed everything 
He turned everything upside down, changed the month. He made priest of all the people. And he simply did too many things that were really sinful for it to really be the truth anymore. It was not God's way. It was Jeroboam's way. And that sometimes happens. I believe that's really what denominationalism is about. Making it convenient sometimes. You've only got to believe. Think about it. If, y'all, if all you had to do is believe, and once you believe, you can never lose your salvation, that would be a doctrine of convenience. We could all simply stay home and not worry about coming every Sunday, worshiping God, because once saved, always saved. That's a very convenient doctrine, but it's simply not true. It's not a biblical doctrine. And then also Joash. Joash in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 1 and 2 was a young king. And he was, the Bible tells us in verses 1 and 2 that Joash was seven years old when he became king. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zilba, Zobiah of Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest, but after the death of Jehoiada. Take your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 24 15. I want you to notice what happened after this. You know, he was faithful. This is one of the sad tragedies of having someone who's a great influence on you. But when that person's gone, and I, I think for young people, it's like our parents. When they're gone, what about when we're off on our own? That's really what happened to Joash here. The Bible tells us in verse 15, Now when Jehoiada reached a ripe old age, he died. He was 130 years old at his death. They buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done well in Israel and to God and to his house. But after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. They abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served Asherim and the idols. So wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their guilt. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. They... Though they testified against them, they would not listen. You know, even kills the son, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, even has him killed. Does not respect the fact that Jehoiada was a great man of God, a great influence in his life. But he rejects all of that in order to go his own way and serve the false gods. <coughs> then we think about the Pharisees who served God out of convenience. Now, you think, well, how was it convenient? Because they were very strict, weren't they? They were extremely strict. The problem <clears throat> is, Matthew 23 tells us, they were strict, and they only did the things they wanted to do. In verse 1, Jesus said, spoke to the crowds and said to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all they, they tell you, do, observe, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay on them on the man's sh- men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. And I'll stop there because you can read on to verse 7. You know, they were doing it because they loved the chief seats and the, the synagogue. They loved the praise of men. They loved to be called rabbi and things like that. It was simply convenient. They were worshiping God in some ways just to have an ego in some ways. Ways that their pride was all about that. So the Pharisees, they would tell people to do things, but they wouldn't do themselves. That's the height of hypocrisy. But it's also convenient for them, but not for other people, if you see what that is. Then there's some disciples of Jesus who turned back. John 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And we look at verse 60, the reason why, because there were some hard sayings of Jesus. They were not willing to do. So they turned back. And when things got tough, when they started hearing things that they didn't really understand, they simply stopped out of convenience. Luke 8, verse 13, the passage I alluded to earlier, he talks about those who hear the word of God, says the ones of the rock are those who when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. Why is it? Because if we all we hear, the, the Christian life is so easy, it's, it's just so easy, like fall off a log, if you will, that everything will be, be 
It's the way you want it to be. You'll be rich. You'll be you faithful. You do all these things. You'll have health, wealth, and all that. Then what happens when real temptations come, real trials come your way? Jesus says those are on the rock or like that who have no root. And they, in time of temptation, time of testing, they fall <clears> away. <throat> That's what happened to Demas. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, when Paul was in prison, you know, Demas made a choice because of that. Here Paul was in prison, and I think that affected him. The Bible says, for Demas has forsaken me. He told Timothy, come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, has departed for Thessalonica. And that's sad because when life is tough, it's going to be tough either way if you're a Christian or non Christian. But in some ways, it can be made tougher because the devil's against us, even more so as a child of God. And we have to stay firm. We have, cannot let the devil destroy our lives. What about us today? We've looked at other people today. We've looked at situations where people stood firm, they were convicted. I was going to use. And I didn't because of the Bible study we were having on Wednesday nights. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with, and Daniel. Those are also people who were convicted and they stood firm. And they were people who, who loved the Lord, loved God more than anything else, even before their own lives. What about us today? How do we keep his commandments? 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 says this. By this we know that we love God. The children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not <clears throat> burdensome. Think about that for a moment. What God asks us to do, come church every Sunday, worship him, sing songs, praise him, take the Lord's Supper, go out and become fishers of men. Now some look at that and say, well, that's, that's too hard. Remember Malachi chapter 1. They found the, the Lord's way that's detestable because it was contemptible because they didn't want to do it. If we love God, coming to church every Sunday is not a convenience or inconvenience, yeah, I should say. It's something we do because we love God and want to be His disciples. It's not too hard. It's not too much for us to devote our lives to His service. And how do we attend all the services of the church? If we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, you know, some people say, well, why do we talk about Hebrews 10 25 so much? Because people still haven't realized what it really says to us about not forsaking the assembling ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There are people who do forsake the Lord's Supper, even to the Lord's assembling, even today. And we have to be careful about that because, you know, coming to services, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and even when it's not the easiest thing to do, I want to say something about people who, who because they live far away from this church building. You know, the convenient thing might be say, well, I can go to a, a church right close to me, even though they're not sound. But yeah, I drive, maybe some of you like drive an hour or so, even more to, to be here every Sunday, every Wednesday night. That speaks about your, your love for the Lord, doesn't it? That speaks about the inconvenience. If it's convenient, you can simply stay home or simply go somewhere that's closer. You know, some people would be hard to even get out if they live right next to the church building. The problem is, we need to have that kind of love that says, no, if I have to drive an hour, maybe even two hours to get to a sound congregation, I will do so and do what's best for the Lord. And how we long for heaven. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says this. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says something about us. We're able to inconvenience our lives now and yet one day be with God in eternal heaven where there is no night, where there is no more suffering, no more things that cause us to be inconvenienced in this life. I look at this life as a testing, as a preparing for eternity. <clears throat> and do we long for that? Do we 
Look, say, y'all, I'm one more day closer to heaven. The people of God who really want to go there are thinking about this. I'm one day closer today, here in, in March 24th of 2024, we're one day closer to eternity. That's something to think about, isn't it? Consider in our lives. And if you're not prepared by obeying the gospel, I'm going to say this, because we often don't give invitation now, but by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, you can be a part of that way of salvation as God has given through his word. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Lesson now, we'll now we'll prepare for our Bible studies.